I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of the Word of God. Revelation chapter 6, we're going to read just two verses and I'll let you be seated. Please stand for the reading of the Word of God. We respect His Word. We acknowledge His Word is the highest authority. So glad that you are all here. Here's what the Word of God says. This is the Apostle John speaking of a vision that he sees in the throne room of God. He says, now I saw the lamb. Everybody say the lamb. lamb. Open one of the seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures saying like a voice of thunder, come and see. And I looked and behold, a white horse, he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. Before we're seated, I want us to ask Jesus to give us understanding today. In fact, I think it'd be a really good idea if every eye would be closed. Nobody looking around, nobody moving around right now. Just be very mindful and respectful of the fact that God has entered this room and his word is about to be preached. I think it'd be good right now if we would all just begin to pray together as we prepare ourselves for where God has taken us today. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, your word is forever settled. Your word is rich and powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. And it divides asunder us from our carnality. Lord, cut into us today. Reshape us by the power of your word. Give us understanding, Lord, of our blessed hope. Lord, thank you that our hope is not in this world. Thank you that our hope is not just to survive in this world. But Lord, thank you that there is the promise of rescue, that you have a hope beyond the the pain of this world. In Jesus' name, we said amen, amen. If you're going to preach with me, you can be seated. So glad that all of you are here today. If you don't mind turning your Bibles to Daniel chapter 7, we're going to be touching on a few verses there and then jumping into the New Testament for some clarification If this is your first time here, first off, let me say welcome home. We are so thankful that you took time out of your day and time out of your weekend to come spend time with us in the the house of God. Uh, We are a church that loves people. We love God. We love people. We never settle, and we like to have fun. And so that's why it's perfectly okay for the pastor's wife to drop a Napoleon Dynamite reference right during the middle of the announcements and expect me not to just, like, go off on that. Like, why would you set me up like that? (sighs) I don't recommend that you spend the afternoon wasting your time on Napoleon Dynamite, but if you do, get your own tots. But anyway, I'm glad that y'all are all here. God is awesome. And we have, we have started a sermon series. It, it's hard to believe that we started this series in the month of January. And it's even harder to believe that this is part 31 of that sermon series. And we will be in this for a little bit because we are preaching and learning through the book of Revelation verse by verse, theme by theme. And I don't know when we're going to get finished. We'll get finished when we get to the end of chapter 22. We are in chapter 6 today. Uh, Two weeks ago we started the first two verses of chapter 6. And today I really hope to get to the end of these two verses. There's just so much stuff in this. And I want to give you some understanding so that you understand. But before I get into the word of God, come on, NOLA Church, let's give a welcome to all of our family in Kenya. Let's give them a hello. Karibu, NOLA, so glad that y'all are joining us. I cannot wait to go there in November. And while I'm I'm on this, let me, is it okay if I just kind of, if you want to be a part of this trip and you were not able to go, obviously, if you have not said you were going, it's too late to go now. The tickets would be like four bajillion dollars. You don't want to do that. But if you still want to be a part of the trip, there are things that you can do. If if you say, pastor, how can I become a part of this trip? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to come talk to myself or my wife after church or any time between now and the time that we go, because there are a lot of things that we can do to get ready for this trip. There's a lot of ministry that's going on. We are doing a crusade Four days in the city of Kasuku. These are street ministry uh, crusades, and it's just going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have a lot of ministry going on, but we're also ordaining 10 pastors' families in the nation of Kenya to be a part of NOLA Church Kenya, and I'm excited about that. Also want to give a shout-out to our family in Australia, Ashley and Tim. God bless you. Come on, let's give them a welcome. 
love what God is doing over there. I'm also excited that we had a birthday present given to the church last week that after the first of the year, sometime at the beginning of the year, Pastor Matt and Alicia are going over there to help Tim and Ashley get things carved out. Everybody has already started assuming they're moving over there. I did not give permission for that. They're going to spend some time there and then they're coming back home because they got to spend time with us. Because if Pastor Matt moved to Australia, that would mean we don't get any more blueberry drop cake. And I'm not okay with that. So that's why that's not the will of God. But it is the will of God that he go over there for a little bit. Amen. Let's also give all of our family in Uganda a welcome with King Jeffrey. We love y'all. Praise God. Were y'all blessed last Sunday by the ministry of our friend Jeffrey Waybury and just like what God is doing through the ministry that he is, he and his family are a part of. He is still traveling in the U.S. for the next month, raising support for their family's orphanages and the ministry that his dad put in place over the last 15, 20 years. And he's going to be traveling until the end of October. So keep him in your prayer. We love Jeffrey. He's an amazing man of God. And he ministered Sunday morning and Sunday night. Man, it was awesome. We had baptism Sunday morning. Then we had another baptism scheduled for Sunday night. Somebody else said, I want to be baptized. We had somebody get the Holy Ghost right over here during the middle of worship. It was awesome. And then like three more people said, I want to be baptized. YTH is off the hook, y'all. If y'all are missing that, y'all, y'all are too old. But, but if they let me, who is 51 now, come to YTH, then you can come too because I'm like one of the oldest people in the church. We have a church of elders and it's amazing. But I'm really glad that all of y'all are here today because we are doing the part two of kind of like a a sermon that was way too long to preach two weeks ago, so I broke it up into two parts. And and if you need a title, I'm, I'm in the middle of the, the section of the book of Revelation that talks about the scroll that has seven seals, and I'm going to be preaching through each seal at a time. We are still in the first seal, and the title of today is The Antichrist, Part 2. So encouraging to get a sermon title named The Antichrist, and everybody's like, I just wanted to know three ways to be a better believer at work. Okay, I'm, I'm about to show you, but not the way you think. <laughs> Pastor, could we just have some life application? Yes. Learn the Bible so you don't go to hell. I'm just saying that's a good life application. (laughs) So we are in this series and we have learned a lot. John, uh, the Apostle John, is in the middle of a 24-hour vision that God took him into and God showed him a lot of stuff. We've learned so much already, but I I, I don't have time to re-preach the whole thing. I'm going to just kind of bring you up from the last sermon very, very quickly. From these two verses... We see the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God is Jesus. And he is beginning to break each one of these seals. And he is opening up each seal. And as he does this, there is an element of the judgment of God that begins to be poured out onto the earth. And this is where a lot of people get nervous. Like, oh my God, I don't want to experience... Anybody just ready to experience the judgment of God in the house? Good answer. No one raised your hand. Everyone's listening. Uh, We don't want to experience the judgment of God. And so as we learn this, we're, we start getting nervous. We start getting apprehensive. But we, we, we see that God is very intentional in what he's doing. And the reason that we have to kind of look at the Old Testament and the New Testament is so that we can have better understanding. I, I mentioned that this is the first of seven seals. Uh, and I'm not talking about the little animal that barks like a dog and flops around in the water. I'm talking about a seal. It, it's, you have to imagine a scroll with seven wax seals that have the imprint of the king of kings and the lord of lords letting them know if anyone breaks this seal you're in trouble in fact john has already seen that no one is worthy to break the seal except the king of kings and the lord of lords who is the lamb of god anybody know his name this morning okay so like four of you do anybody know his name this morning there we go so this, this seal, there's a lot of things that happen in these seven seals, and we're, we're going to unpack this over the next few weeks, going through, uh, starting with Revelation chapter 6. But to have better understanding, we have to look at what the Word of God has already said. This period of time of this first seal was prophesied by the, the prophet Daniel roughly around 553 B.C., 
There is some debate as to whether or not that is the actual year. I can tell you why I believe that is the actual year because in his prophecy, Daniel says that this was roughly around the time of King Belteshazzar's first year of reign, which we know historically was the year 553 B.C. Why is that controversial? Because there are people who do not believe in divine prophecy. And they do not believe that Daniel could have foreseen things by the power and the divine inspiration of God, things that would happen three and four and five and six hundred years later, much less four thousand years later. We, people say, well, there's no way that Daniel could have known this unless he saw it. No, let me tell you, my friend, God sees the end of the thing from the beginning of the thing and the beginning of the thing from the ending of the thing. And he has the ability to speak into a willing vessel and tell them things that are not as though they already were. Biblical prophecy is not something to be scared about. Biblical prophecy is something to be illuminated by. The book of Revelation is the book of unveiling. And as we read prophecy, we begin to see things unveiled. And people say, I don't want to read Revelation. Why are you spending so much time preaching? Because the book of Revelation says the people who read this book are blessed of God. I don't know about you, but I want to be blessed of God and I want you to be blessed of God. So it's very important that we read this book. So Daniel is prophesying roughly around the year 553 B.C. And where John sees in our reading today, John saw a rider on a white horse. And as we learned a couple weeks ago, that rider on the white horse is the Antichrist. He is the first instrument of God's judgment. He is not the judgment of God. He is not the one who is the source of judgment. He is working for God. He is doing something on God's behalf. And like, I thought the Antichrist was against God. God said, go do this. God will use an instrument to render his will whenever he decides to do that because he's God, amen? And so God sends the rider on the white horse to bring the first area of judgment. But Daniel in his prophecy, as we learned two weeks ago, Daniel sees four beasts coming out of what we know is the Mediterranean Sea. He sees this dream. And he sees these beasts coming out. We spent a lot of time on that. If you miss any part of it, go to our YouTube channel. Look for NOLA Church on YouTube and you can get caught up. And we also learned that these four beasts represent four kingdoms of the world. So if, if we look back into Daniel's dream, I want, I want us to look at Daniel chapter 7. We're going to look at three verses here to get some deeper understanding. Daniel has already seen what is going on. He's starting to see some things. He's got some questions. And he says, I came near one of those who stood by. And we don't know exactly who this is, but because of what is said and what is said later on, most people, most theologians would agree that the person or, or the, the individual that he reaches out to to ask questions is more than likely the angel Gabriel. And he says, he asked them the truth of all this. And he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Why do we believe it might possibly be Gabriel? Because Gabriel throughout the Bible is bringing interpretation to different things. And he's bringing the word of God to different people in different time periods. But it's interesting to know he wanted to know the interpretation of these things. He was not asking for Gabriel's interpretation. He was not asking another believer uh, in the congregation or in the small group, like, what's your interpretation? What does this mean to you? He, Daniel wasn't going on to the blogosphere and on the Facebook and on, on the various socials saying, what does this scripture mean? He didn't want someone's private interpretation because if you know anything about the word of God, you know the word of God is not open to private interpretation. If you're a student of the word of God, which is what I encourage you to be, you begin to learn that the word of God literally interprets itself. Like, I don't see the interpretation. You need to be patient and allow God to bring you into that, in, that, that understanding that is the interpretation of what he has already said. But here in this section, he's, he's wanting to not just know, tell me some things about this. No, he's saying, I want to know exactly what this means. I don't know, I don't know if, if, if you and I are, can sometimes get that passion of Daniel that says, I, I'm tired of living in the lack of clarity. I want something to come alive in me that washes away the fog of confusion. 
I, I see things happen and I recognize things that happen in my life. I'm facing things. Maybe it's things that I cause myself or maybe it's just life happening. But I really wish to God that I had some clarity. Anybody besides me ever feel that sometimes? This is where Daniel is. I'm like, he's in this vision. He's seeing these horrible things take place. And he knows it's from God. He's like, I need some deeper understanding. Don't tell me about it. Tell me exactly what it means. And the, I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say this, Internet Karens, I, I know that no one knows exactly, so save your emails. But for the sake of this, we're going to just say it's Gabriel talking. Gabriel responds and says, these, grace, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. So we know that he's speaking of kingdom. You're like, well, I don't, I don't really care. What does that matter to me? Two weeks ago, we learned that these four kingdoms are the kingdoms of the world that have been established to bring about subjugation to God's people, but also to usher in the first advent of Christ, which is his birth, and then ultimately the second advent of Christ, which is his return. And we, we get down and we studied them all. The last of the four beasts was the Roman Empire. If you remember that, it was the Roman Empire. But the Roman Empire actually has two prophecies attached to it. This is, this is a, 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 a double prophetic speaking. When Daniel sees the Roman Empire, he doesn't just see the ancient Roman Empire that was uh, around 31 B.C.-ish, somewhere in that range. He sees that because that is the empire that actually ushered in the birth of Christ. God's people became subjugated by the Roman Empire. This paves the way for Jesus to robe himself in flesh and be born uh, by Mary in, in the manger and everything about Christmas. And, you know, like we're only like two and a half months away from Christmas. Y'all knew that? Yeah. He wasn't born in December, but that's just when we remember it and all that. The Roman Empire is what ushered in the birth of Christ. But there, the other side of the prophecy is it's the prophecy of the second Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was wiped out temporarily. And it's interesting how God sees temporarily. For a few thousand years, the Roman Empire was wiped out. But it's coming back to usher in the second advent of Christ, which is going to happen after the rapture of the church. He said, how do I know it's after the rapture of the church? Because this second Roman Empire literally is the kingdom of the Antichrist. The Antichrist has power in this world. God literally gives him the power. Remember, we saw in the scripture that he's wearing a crown. Where did he get the crown? He got the crown from God himself. God sends him in the spirit of God. The four living creatures represent the four aspects of God's character. And they say, go do your work. The Spirit of God says, go into the world and do what you have to do. The authority of what the Antichrist does in the world comes from God. But the Antichrist has a very specific job. He establishes a kingdom and brings a temporary peace. But the church is not here when it happens. And I know that there's theological discussion on that. But the problem is the theological discussion makes a humongous mistake. And I want to help prevent you from making this mistake and your understanding. If you read the word of God through the lens of today back toward the New Testament, it's very easy to read the word of God through a Western lens and think everything that happens in the Bible is about North America. And it's also very easy to overlook the fact that God has a chosen nation and, everybody say and, God also has a bride. The chosen nation and the bride of Christ are not the same. And this is, very, this is a very common mistake because what happens when people misread the word of God through the lens of Western understanding, they do what's called conflating Israel and the church. And so when they read the book of Revelation and they, and they read the, the prophetic books from the Old Testament, they say, oh, all of this is about Israel, therefore all of this is about the church. But my friend, that's not the, the truth. The church of God is different from the chosen nation. Our eternal reward, as we'll learn here in just a second, are not even the same thing. Our responsibility in the world is not the same thing. The bride of Christ is rescued by Jesus before he begins to render judgment. How do we know this? Because the Bible tells us multiple times that he has not appointed his bride unto wrath. 
And the kingdom of the Antichrist has a very specific purpose. God has ordained the Antichrist to fill the earth and to establish a kingdom in the earth for one purpose and one purpose only. That is to torment Israel. And I've already gotten some emails from some people, not, no one from the church, and I, I don't normally air dirty laundry in front of everybody, but I, I just I want to say this because it's very important, especially in our day and age of everybody getting offended over every little thing that happens and feeling like it's okay to just rip people apart because they're offended. I am not anti-Semitic. Saying that God is going to terrorize the nation of Israel is not anti-Semitic. Israel is the chosen nation of God. They are God's chosen people. God is the one that established the nation. They are the ones who walked away from him. And he is going to do whatever he can to bring them back to him. I love the nation of Israel. We should pray for the nation of Israel more and more and more. Politically, we should get behind the nation of Israel. That doesn't mean we agree with everything that they're doing. But the Bible says those who pray for the nation of Israel will be blessed by God. Recognize when politics starts drifting away, it's setting us up for end time prophecy to come about. And so God has a plan with the Antichrist. The Antichrist kingdom is designed specifically by God to terrorize Israel, not the bride. And if you're a part of the bride, you've already been rescued at this point in the story. And here's what I want to do. I want to break this down so you understand this. And here's the reason why. Because if you believe that you're about to go through seven years of absolute terror from God, you have no hope in this world. I don't know about you, but life is already tough enough. I don't need to add seven years of absolute hell into the story. But there is a blessed hope that we are reaching for. Look at your neighbor and say, there is a blessed hope. Let's look at Daniel chapter 7 verse 18. And here's what he says. Gabriel has already told him that the great beasts which are four or four kings which arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High. Everybody say the saints. The saints. Not, not the ones that are playing later on today or Monday or Thursday, whenever they're playing. I literally don't care, but that's not who I'm talking about. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom. Who's receiving the kingdom? Okay, the saints of the Most High. Very good. Thank, thank you for, for clarifying that, Pastor Chris. Just going all the way, not just saying the saints of the Most High. And notice what else. The, the saints are not just going to receive the kingdom. They're also going to possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. They're going to possess the kingdom of God forever and even forever and ever. So what does this even mean? Like The saints, like we live in New Orleans. We're surrounded by liturgical religion that literally does a whole lot of things to the saints. And we, a bunch of y'all worship the saints throughout the year until they do bad. And then you act like you didn't know them at all. Um, <laughs> I feel a little bit like uh, the prophet Elijah. Like, <laughs> where's your God at? Like every time the saints lose, like, where's your God at? Maybe he's on vacation. <laughs> You spent all that time buying them season tickets, and your team sucks. <laughs> Pastor, are you against sports? Well, if it takes you out of the house of God, if it takes you away from the things of God, if it's more important to you than Jesus, maybe, maybe, but y'all didn't ask for that today, but whatever, let's move on. Uh, who are the saints of the Most High? Israel, in this context, are the saints of the Most High. This, this is not a reference to the church. This is not a reference to Christian martyrs. This is also not a reference to really, really, really good religious figures who may or may not have done some mystical miracle at some point. We don't pray to the saints because that's ungodly. You only pray to Jesus. If you're praying to dead people, they're not hearing you. You might be praying to something you don't know about. Be careful doing that. Uh, I'm sure that Thomas Aquinas was a really good guy, but don't pray for him. He is sleeping. He does not know what you're doing, I promise you. If you're praying to Mother Mary, awesome, good, good for you. She's not hearing you. She's also asleep because she is a human being who is dead. Dead people can't hear what you're saying. The dead are gone. And when we pray to dead people, we are practicing what's called divination. That's a type of witchcraft, and we are literally entertaining evil spirits. You also didn't ask for that, but there, there you go. You need to know that. So the saints here is, is actually... 
in, in the Hebrew, it's the word kadesh. It's the word kadesh, which means a holy people, people separated unto Yehovah or to Yahweh or to God. The kadesh are the holy people. Notice this, they are holy and they are separated unto God. They're not weird and separated. They're not a bunch of freakazoids in the world. They are separated to God. You can be separated and actually be a hindrance to someone finding salvation. But when you're separated unto God, your separation actually opens the door for other people to find him. Just thought I'd drop that in there because that's important. In this context here in Daniel's prophecy, the saints of the Most High is a direct reference to the Kadesh, which is Israel. The people that God has separated unto himself for a specific purpose. Because Israel, as we've already established, is the chosen nation. And what we're seeing here in Daniel chapter 7, verse 18, is that Israel will receive, and they're going to receive, and they're going to possess the kingdom. Now, this is very, very, very important. They are receiving, and they are possessing the kingdom. If you're taking notes, this would be a good place to take notes. What God is showing us here in Daniel 7 verse 18 is that the nation of Israel is going to have dominion in the kingdom. But they do not receive authority in the kingdom. Receiving and possessing is dominion. It's not authority. You say, okay, well, what is that all about? This is the fulfillment of of God's covenant promise to Abraham. It is the fulfillment of his covenant promise to Moses. It's also the fulfillment of the covenant promise to every covenant that he made throughout the entire Old Testament. When we get into Exodus chapter 6, verse 6, 7, and 8, God makes a promise. I'm going to bring you into this land and I'm going to give it to you as a possession. In other words, I'm going to give it to you so that you can have dominion in the promise. Israel will receive and possess the dominion of the promise, but they will not receive the authority. What we just heard right here is one of the many instances where the eternal promise of Israel is laid out clearly in the Bible. The eternal promise of Israel is to both receive and possess the dominion of physical geographical land in the new earth. That is the promise of God. Many of you are like, you're lost right now. This is so deep. I, I, hang on, we're going somewhere. That is not the eternal promise of the bride of Christ. This is why we cannot make them one and the same. This is why we can't say goofy spiritual things like, oh, we're spiritual Israelites. No, we're not. We're the bride of Christ. Nothing wrong with being a spiritual Israelite, but that's not who we are. We've been bought and paid for by Jesus Christ. We, we are from an order of priesthood that is from the order of Melchizedek, which predates the order of Levi. We're not bound to the covenant of the Mosaic law. We're not bound to the Torah. We are not bound by any of that. We have been grafted into Torah by the one who is Torah himself. The bride of Christ is not Israel, and Israel is not the bride of Christ. We have a chosen nation, and we have the bride. The chosen nation gets dominion, but the bride of Christ gets authority. The eternal promise to the chosen nation is, hey, I, I promise you, I don't care how many times you walk away from me, and somebody can learn the lesson from this. This may not directly apply to us, but we can definitely learn the lesson. Y'all remember that, that little, the, the, here's the deal. God made a promise, and even when you and I walk away, he does not walk away from his promise. If he made a promise, you can take it to the bank. It's going to happen. Well, when's it going to happen, pastor? I don't know. Stop asking me. I don't know. I'm not a prophet. I'm a pastor. I don't have a crystal ball down by the cathedral of sin down in the quarter. I, I can't tell you your future. I can't read your tarot cards. I can't look at your tea leaves and tell you. By the way, no one else can either. I don't know what's going to happen in your story. God may show me, but he hasn't shown me. But I do know this. If he made you a promise, you can bet on it. You can build your life on it. For the promises of God are yes and amen. amen. And God made a promise to Abraham before there ever was a nation of Israel. He said, through you, every nation of the world is going to be blessed. And God has never backed off of that promise one time. 
And as we read through First and Second Kings and as we read through all of the things in the Old Testament, we see God's people continue over and over and over and over, walking away. There's a king, they're like, he's doing things right, and then he falls away. And then another one comes, but he does things worse, he falls away. It's just all of this, acting like humans. Isn't it crazy how humans act like humans? That's why we shouldn't be so judgmental. They set up and they fall away, set up and fall away. And God's like, all right, you've fallen away, you've fallen. But I'm still bound to my promise to you. And my promise is to give you geographical land in the new earth. You're going to receive it. You're going to possess it. You're going to have dominion. But the authority is reserved for my bride. Remember, I told you we're learning about our blessed hope today. Our hope is not just to get some plot of land. Our hope is not to get some sort of spiritual reparations because of past wrongs. That's not, the, that's not the plan. That's not God. That's not even how God works. God said, I've got a plan and I've got a purpose. I'm going to give the possession and the dominion to my chosen nation because I promised, but I'm going to give the authority to my bride. You say, well, well, why is the Antichrist even coming? Because the Antichrist is coming to terrorize Israel. And said, well, pastor, how do you know that? Look at verse 21 of Daniel 7. It says, this same horn, which is a direct reference to the Antichrist, the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Next Sunday, we're going to unpack that a little bit more so you understand this. The saints, again, the Kadesh, this is Israel, not the bride. And how do I know it's not the bride? Well, number one, he's, he's speaking directly of Israel. But the other reason that I know is because the bride has already been rescued. There's so many theological opinions on this. There's pre-tribulation rapture. There's pre-wrath tribulation rapture. There's mid-tribulation rapture theory. There's also post-tribulation rapture theory. We talked about it a little bit a couple weeks ago. People who believe that the church is going to go through this, they believe that the bride is still there and we are going through it with Israel. But my friend, that's not true because if that were true, God is a liar. And if that were true, God is the worst husband that a bride has ever received. I'm going to blow the trumpet for you and then I'm going to beat you for seven years. What kind of marriage is that? What kind of relationship? That, that's how a lot of people already view God. Thanks to media, thanks to entertainment, thanks to bad society that doesn't know God, thanks to bad Christians who don't know any better than to keep their mouth shut instead of ranting everything on social media. Like people, just like in Isaiah, God said, the pagans of the world are against me because of my people. Like People believe all this junk about God, but God is not an abusive husband. The bride of Christ is the wife of Christ. It's another way of putting it. God is not going to say, I love you with an undying love. I'm going to give my life to you. You're too nervous because I'm talking about the Antichrist, but like that, that's the truth. If God were an abusive husband, then maybe, yeah, okay, brace yourself. I'm so glad that you received the blessed joy of salvation. Your blessed hope is you've got seven years of crap coming on you. Happy wedding day. That's the worst wedding gift you could ever give somebody. Seven years of hell. Here you go. It's a free subscription. It's only going to cost you a million dollars a month. You know, it's just like, this is not how God does things because this is not the character of God. The blessed hope of the bride is not to receive some plot of land in the new earth. The blessed hope of the bride is to be rescued before the whole earth that we are part of now is literally destroyed by fire from God. Our blessed hope is not to survive. Our blessed hope is not to somehow escape what the Antichrist is doing in the world. Our blessed hope happens before he ever comes on the scene in the first place. So let's break this down. Our blessed hope isn't to survive the terror of the Antichrist. Everybody look at 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 52. And this is what he says. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Everybody say a mystery. 
You don't know what it is. You need to be like spiritual Sherlock Holmes so you can get this. And, and this is what Paul says. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Here, let me tell you something, believer. You may not die in Christ. God is not trying to kill you. Some people are going to die, but it may not be you. But I promise you this. Every person who names the name of Christ is going to be radically an altered change. It's going to be eternally altered from who they've been. Radically changed into a new creature and if we keep on reading in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we, everybody say we shall be changed a few weeks ago we dived into this a little bit and a couple months ago we dived into it a lot on Wednesday night y'all remember the sermon or the study on the feast of trumpets Right here, Paul is referencing that ancient feast. And he says that last trumpet, the Feast of Trumpets, had two trumpets that were played in the Feast of Trumpets. The first one was a short blast. Bap! Y'all remember that in the echo in the service? That's the call to repentance. It's short. But the second blast is a call to relocate. The first blast is called the first trumpet. The second blast is called the last trumpet. Because there's only two trumpets in the Feast of Trumpets. The first one is the first one. The Bible is so hard to understand. The first one is the first one. And the big yellow one is the sun. But anyway, like the first trumpet is called the first trumpet. The second one is called the last trumpet. Because on the Feast of Trumpets, there's only two. The last one is not a call to repentance. It's a call to relocate. So what Paul is saying here is we're all going to be changed. It's a mystery. None of us fully understand this because none of us have experienced this yet. Bump your neighbor say yet. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Not when the call to repentance happens. That's not when the change takes place. That's when we start living the change. This is how you become a part of the bride. You hear that first trumpet and you lean into repentance and you change your mind. And then every day you wake up and you live a life of change in your actions. And you're preparing every day for that second trumpet because there's coming a day. It's a hidden day. No man knows the day nor the hour. But God is going to say, hey, Gabe, it's time to blow the trumpet. And Gabriel's going to give the greatest interpretation he's ever given he's going to blow the trumpet and the dead in Christ will rise first and we who are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds our blessed hope isn't to survive the antichrist our blessed hope is to be rescued by Jesus at the last trumpet you gotta, you gotta encourage yourself with your blessed hope because life is bad if you don't believe it, turn on the news. They will tell you in the first A block of the segment just how bad it is. Tune in for the B block and you're going to hear just how bad it is. Again, go to the C block and guess what you're going to find? It's bad again. Filled with commercials for diarrhea and all the other things that you got. It's just bad. I think that's why they play those commercials during the news. Like you're already in a bad mood. Like I need to know how to fix things, you know. You didn't ask for that, but there you go. Life is bad. You need to know there's a blessed hope. You need to know that this is not all there is. You need to know that there is hope in Jesus, and it's not just to get you through tomorrow. Paul said, if I, if I have hope in Jesus only in this life, I'm among all men most miserable. But our hope is to be rescued at the last trumpet. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. And here's what it says. For the Lord... Uh, oh, hello, puberty. <clears throat> Kids, it ain't over. 51, I'm still... <laughs> Y'all didn't ask for this either, but I, I remember the first time I got the nerve to ask a girl out on a date. I had one of those puberty cracks in my voice. Her name was Rebecca. And I walked up to Rebecca and I said, hey. <laughs> Needless to say, we did not go out for lunch at school that day. 
Needless to say, I had a whole lot more years of alone time. But anyway, the Lord himself, everybody say the Lord himself. The Lord, who's going to descend? The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Some of you are way too quiet in this world. I just, I just want to soak in the presence of God. God is not your yoga studio. God is not your quiet time at home. Praise and worship is not a time for you to sit and reflect. That's what prayer time is about. Praise and worship is a time for you to get in the presence of God and let the victory that you have received start to come out. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord where? In the air. Why is that important? Because if this was happening after the seven years, he's descending all the way down to the earth. There would be no reason to meet him in the air, but because he's not returning at the trumpet, we are going to meet him in the air and thus shall we ever be with the Lord. We're going to meet him when that trumpet sounds. He's not coming down to meet us. We got a honeymoon before that. He's got a job to do with Israel before that. But when he's done his job with Israel, as we're going to learn about next week, when he's done his job with Israel, he is descending back all the way to the earth and he will come in and with a voice, he will destroy the kingdoms of the Antichrist and all the other kingdoms of the world. He's not going to pick up a sword because his word is the sword. He's going to open his mouth and speak a word and every kingdom of the world... Every bit of pain, every bit of sorrow, every bit of disease, everything that has marginalized anybody forever in one word of the creator, it's over. But that doesn't happen yet. That's when we come back with him. But notice the last part of verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Okay, I got to back up just a little bit. Here's the, the primary reason that I don't believe that the church is going to go through the seven years of tribulation. That's not very comforting. That's not a blessed hope. If I'm supposed to look at you in the eye, Evan, when all hell is breaking loose in your life, and you're like, Pastor, I just need a word, and in my flesh, I don't have anything, and God hasn't told me anything. But I'm supposed to look at you and say, Evan, I know it's tough. I know there are some things that are happening that you don't understand and things that are happening outside of you that, that are affecting you. And I know that it gets you down. I know this because I see sometimes you're carrying it and it's weighing you down. I'm not supposed to look at you and say, I'm going to pray for you. Have a good day. Bye. I'm supposed to look at you and say, this is not the end. Rescue's coming. Joy is coming, coming, coming in the morning. It, it's not here right now. I wish it were. But in the meantime, I'm going to put my arm around you and I'm going to walk through this veil of tears and I'm going to walk with you and hang on to you until I can get you to that place of rescue. I'm going to encourage my brothers and sisters with the fact that this is not the end. Our blessed hope is not to survive. Our blessed hope is to be rescued. The bride is going to be caught up the word rapture is not a biblical word, but the word rapture literally means caught up. It means rescue. That's why we use that word. And our blessed hope is to be raptured. Not to be met by God in this earth. What kind of eternity is that? That's what we're living in now. He meets us in our worship. No, we, we're coming back with authority. We're not coming back with dominion. We're coming back with authority. It's not our job to possess the kingdom in the eternity. It's our job to be the authority of the kingdom. He said, well, pastor, that, that's all well and good, but I don't know how to get that blessed hope. So glad you asked that question. So glad you asked that question. There's two things that need to happen in your life. I'm going to ask nobody to be moving around at this point. Because God's already reaching for some people right here at the end of this service. He's already moving. 
There's two things that need to happen. First, you need to see the kingdom. Everybody say, see the kingdom. And then you also need to enter the kingdom. Everybody say, enter the kingdom. Okay, seeing the kingdom is something that happens in the here and the now. Entering the kingdom is something that happens at rescue. Let me break this down. John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus is in a conversation with a very devout man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus is asking some very important questions because he recognizes something different about Jesus. And it's a little confusion because he's seeing that Jesus is the manifestation of the invisible God that he has worshipped his entire life. He's recognizing what Jesus is saying as being the words of Messiah. He's recognizing what Jesus is doing as being the actions of Messiah. And everything is lining up, but he's just got to make sure. Somebody, we feel like Nicodemus, Nicodemus something like, I, I just got to make sure, God, I know you said it. Let, are you sure? And this is what Jesus says to Nicodemus. Most assuredly, I love the way the King James puts it. Verily, verily, I say unto thee. Most assuredly, I say to you. Unless, everybody say, unless. unless. Well, that's not very inclusive, Pastor. No, God's the one that said it, not me. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, here's the condition. The condition is you've got to be born again to see the kingdom of God. Remember I told you seeing the kingdom of God is something that we see in our reality. If you're living in hell, if you're living in absolute terror in this life and you don't know where, where to turn, everywhere you look, things are falling apart. You turn on the news, you see the devastation. You bump into somebody, you see devastation. You go to work, it's devastation. You go to school, it's devastation. Whatever's happening, it's just blah. You can't see anything, but you need to be born again because you're never going to see it unless you're born again. You can't see what God's doing through the natural you got to be born again. But I'm alive. I know you're alive. But you can't see what God's doing because you haven't been reborn. You need to be reborn. Well, great, Pastor. How do I get reborn? I'm so glad you asked it. It's just so cool. The Bible, remember, it interprets itself. Repent and be water baptized. Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 3 that water baptism is where we are reborn because we come up out of that water. We're resurrected into a brand new life and we put on Jesus like we're putting on brand new clothes. The born again experience doesn't happen when you confess God. The born again experience happens when you rise up out of that grave and when you come up out of the water, you are born again. You are no longer who you were and now you have the ability to see the kingdom of God in this life. You're going to see everything else. That doesn't mean all the bad stuff goes away. I really wish, but that's, that's not how it works. You're about to be rescued, but now you can actually see there's hope because you, be, you begin to see things that are not as though they already were. You start seeing through eyes of faith and the mind that is in Christ it becomes also in you and, and your, your mind starts going away and your thoughts start going away and all of a sudden he starts speaking to you in the middle of the night and he wakes you up in dreams and he sings over you and you're like, oh my God, when did this? Because you got born again. You repented and you got baptized. You took care of the stain of the past. You took care of the stain of the future and now you are one with Christ. That's seeing the kingdom, but there's also... We have to enter the kingdom. Everybody say, enter the kingdom. Skip down to verse 5 in John 3. And Jesus is still talking to Nicodemus. And he says, hey, Nicky, I want you to hear me. This Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit. Everybody say, and the Spirit. At Nola College this past week, we actually dived into this verse of Scripture. Being born of water is nothing spiritual. Don't read too much into that. That just simply means you're born in this life. You have to be a human who is alive. By the way, that's why sanctity of life is so important. That's why abortion is not a political pawn and not a political tool that we can use to get elected or not get elected. We need to respect the sanctity of life. Because if you're born, you have access to enter the kingdom of God. you got to first be born of water. Why, why water? What, what does that have to do with birth? I, it, just in case they did not teach you this in school because they were teaching you all the trans I ideology. When a woman is about to have a baby, the water breaks. That's what that's talking about. You're born naturally. You have to be born naturally to enter the kingdom of God. 
Someone said, told me one time, I was baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost in my mother's womb. No, you were not because you weren't born yet. You're not John the Baptist. Chill. If you are, I want to see you eating locusts. I'm just saying. This individual probably would, but whatever. You got you to gotta actually be born into the earth in order to see the kingdom of God or to enter the kingdom of God. But he doesn't stop there. You also have to be born and the spirit. Say, and the spirit. And the spirit. That's a completely different type of birth. Well, I was born again in water baptism. Yes, you were. But you need a spirit baptism to happen in your life to enter. And how do I know this? Because unless you're born of water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. If you're only born of the flesh, guess what you're going to be for all eternity? Flesh. But if you're born of the spirit, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And here's what's really interesting. The Greek words here are so important. That first word there is the word neo, which means directly the breath of God. The second word is pneuma, which is a wind. So the first one, the breath of God, in the New Testament, in that Greek language, it, there, there's, a, there's a violence that is attached to that word, neo. God is not passive. When God, chase, when God begins to move in your life, he doesn't just go, oh, God bless you, and then move off. When God begins to breathe in your life, he goes, it's violent. It's an exhalation of his character. It's not a dove. It's not the third part of himself. It is his breath going, it's violent. Why violent? Because you're living surrounded by violence and you need the violence of God to literally wash away everything that's in your life. But when you're born of spirit, the violence of the almighty God that is not pointed at you, but is working for you, begins to breathe onto your hell, begins to breathe onto your chaos, begins to breathe onto the hurt and the pain that you're living in. And he goes, when you begin to receive the breath of God and all of a sudden you get transitioned into a new type of person. You're not in the flesh now you walk in the spirit. And when you walk in the spirit, the things of this life don't have near the impact on you that they do. Why am I always going through pain? Are you walking in the spirit? It's probably not going to go away, but I promise you, you won't notice it as much because when you're walking in the spirit, when hell comes against you, you say, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Drifted off onto a whole other sermon here, but you got to hear me. Your blessed hope is not in this world. God says, I'm going to get you out of this world. I'm going to give you something that's going to get you through this world. And then I'm going to give you something that's going to take you into the next world. Because you're not going in to possess anything. You're not going in for dominion. You're going in for authority. Your eternity is bound in authority. It's not just bound in getting stuff. I've got a blessed hope for you. Understanding what God has for us. Understanding what God has prepared for us so vitally important. And as we read through the book of the unveiling of Jesus Christ, the book of Revelation, instead of getting afraid, instead of getting scared, there should be something start to rise up on the inside. Like, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up. Somewhere beyond the blue, and the angels beckon me to heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. You can plan. You can put all your eggs in the future that your own internal economy is going to create. 
You can skimp, you can save, you can strive trying to build a future in this earth. But my friend, this earth is going to burn up with an all-consuming fire. As for me and my house, we're going to be preparing for rescue. Jade, Eden, Adia, Kylie, we're preparing for rescue. No, you can't go there. No, you can't do that. Why can't I go there, Dad? Because I want to prepare you for rescue. But I want to be friends with this person. No, that person is dragging you away from God. We're preparing for rescue. No, you better put that thing down. You don't need to be on social media all day long, every day, because all it's doing is hurting your brain. No, you can't do that because I love you, and I'm preparing you for rescue. Notice I didn't say anything about the church. I'm talking about me and my house. This is how we're going to lead. We're preparing for rescue. Anybody want to be rescued with me? Anybody ready for rescue? Anybody feel like, I need to take this step. Why don't we stand to our feet right now? Here's what I want us to do. Nobody moving around. Every eye closed. In fact, you want to go ahead and lift your hands right now. God is moving in this house. Jesus, I pray that you would begin to move. On somebody's heart, right here and right now.